tonight's topic is topic 58, <clears throat> and the uh, topic's uh, called Prophet, Priest, and King. So let's continue with that. Um, as an introduction, uh, you might have heard the teaching of, uh, of uh, kings and priests. And I know Dr. Arthur has also been doing a lot of teaching along that particular line over a, for a while. And uh, we're going to most probably tackle it from a slightly different angle this evening. And we're going to come from a, a slightly different direction. And that is that we're going to look at this particular place where um, the function of a prophet, a priest, and a king. So if we look at this tonight, uh, Jesus held all three positions, all right? So let's look at Matthew chapter 21, verse 9 through 11. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, in this particular passage of Scripture, it talks about the, the, um, Jesus being a prophet, being recognized as a prophet. So he came with that um, mantle, with that anointing, and uh, he fulfilled that function. Now, Jesus fulfilled all three of these that we're going to be talking about tonight, about the priest, about the king, and about the prophet. So <clears throat> we're going to, in this module tonight, like, uh, look at that as Jesus' role. Then we're also going to take that and apply it to you and me, and we're going to see how that also affects our ministry and what we do and how we go forward. So those are the goals tonight, and that's what we're going to try and achieve by this particular teaching. So in this passage, Matthew chapter 21, 21 verse 9 through 11 then, we learn that Jesus is recognized as a prophet. So he operated in the prophetic anointing, in that position. Then we look at high priest. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 through 2 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful in all his house. Talks there about the high priest in verse 1, um, the apostle and high priest of our confession. All right. Then we also fulfill the position or the function of a king. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. It says that you, verse 14, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, to set a bit of context and set a bit of background here for you guys. The classical teaching or the teaching that's been around for a, for a while about kings and priests talks about the kings being the, the providers for the ministry and then it talks about the priests as being the clergy or the ones that present the word of God. Now, <clears throat> we understand what they're trying to say and we understand what they're teaching, but from our perspective it goes further than that. It's not, it not, doesn't only mean that you are, can only be a priest or you can only be a king. I believe that you can be both. You can be, there's a function, there's a position that you and I have to fulfill, and we enter into the, the, um, the role of a priest, and we enter into the role of a king, and we enter the role of a prophet. <coughs> Excuse me, so there's different roles that you and I fulfill in our mandate as a born-again believer. And a lot of what, we, what that does in our lives is it releases and it lets go the, the gifting that's inside of us. And you will be equipped to handle that which that, um, that you need to go into, that which God has anointed you and I to do. So because you and I have been anointed to do that, you will be gifted for that. And we'll touch that as we go along. Okay, so let's have a look then quickly at these three positions that we found, find that Jesus already fulfilled and went through. The first one is a prophet. It says, <clears throat> John chapter 8 and verse 38, it says, Yeah, and sorry, um, I speak that what, I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. Now we know and understand that Jesus made this statement. He says, he only says and only does what his father tells him and instructs him to do. Now a prophet deals from hearing from God and then communicating that to man. You and I know that as a prophet, the Bible makes it very clear that 
You can have a prophetic gifting, you can have a prophetic office, and in this context we're not talking about the prophetic office, but we're talking more about the, the, the prophetic gifting and the ability to prophesy. So that is more that we're, that we're covering in this particular section. Then the high priest, <coughs> in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So from a high priest perspective then, it's a communication or the, or the intercession from man to God. In Hebrews chapter 3 through to verse, uh, chapter 7, you'll find that whole section in Hebrews talks extensively about Jesus being our high priest and how he's gone to heaven and make it, made a way and forever interceding for us in heaven. And you and I need to understand that when we talk about a priest, a priest is the go-between between man and God. And he is the one that goes and normally makes petitions. He is the one that ministers on behalf of. And if you look at the Old Testament, you'll see that there's a lot of the... the, the um, Things that were done in the temple, like the sacrifices, like the preparation of things, all that kind of stuff was all done by the priests, okay? And they would then minister that between man and God, offer the sacrifices, do whatever needs to be done. Then we've got the, the, the kingly position. Now, a king, we know, is covering a rulership position. Because you normally see a king as a domain, he has a, a, a geographical piece of ground normally, and normally there's some subjects or citizens that will be in his, in his kingdom. And in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15 through 16 says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule, with the, rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we're talking here about the rulership. Now we also understand and know that when Jesus came to this earth in Matthew chapter 4, it talks for the first time about the fact that he's introducing a kingdom. He's brought a new kingdom into this world. So his kingdom, the kingdom of God, he's introducing to us, telling us that when we accept him, we become part of that kingdom. And when you and I become part of that kingdom, we obviously become subjects of that kingdom, and we obviously come under the rule of Christ. Now, that is all talking about Jesus, his position, and the fact that he fulfills the role of a prophet, he fulfills the role of a priest, and he fulfills the role of a king. So we quite, we, we, we know about that and we understand that. So now let's apply that information, that, what we've learned there, into your and my life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, it instructs us, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church, and he instructs them, he says, imitate me even as I imitate Christ. You see, when Paul came to this world, he set an example. He said, listen, even if, if you look at me and see what I do, if you do it, imitate me. You will go, you'll get to the, to the destination we want to get to. So he is comfortable to tell people to do that. So we need to understand that as we come into that place, that God has given us that um, responsibility of ruling in this life and imitating Christ in this life. So Jesus is our ultimate example, and everything that we do, we do because we're inspired by Him, but because we're instructed by Him, because we see by Him. So we need ourselves to become an example. Just as Paul was an example, we need to become an example. So as we become an example, we need to be able to tell people, imitate us, even as we imitate Christ. Now, obviously, the first place it's going to be of, of, of uh, application or where we're going to need to use it is in the context of our own families. Obviously, in our own families, we want to set an example to our spouse, to our children, to our extended family of what Christ is and who Christ is, all right? So that when they look at us, they can see Christ in us, and that is the goal that we obviously strive towards. So we set an example. We are the ones that put the example out there for the people to follow and to see. So in our household as well, we then um, represent Christ, we show Christ in our attitude, in our conduct, in what we do, the examples we set, the, the way we train our children, the way we bring them up. Um, all these things are affected by who we are. 
And it's important, it's critical that you and I understand that these things cannot be taken lightly. Because as we come into this place, we need to understand that we have to take Jesus as our ultimate example. So as we do that, then let's have a look at these functions that we are given through Christ. All right. So we understand Christ fulfilled the role of a prophet. He fulfilled the role of a priest. He fulfilled the role of a, of a, of a king. So we then imitate Christ in our lives and in our family and in our social circles, in our communities, in our churches. So now we need to apply that in what we do. So let's have a look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, And He has made us kings and priests to His God and Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That is Jesus speaking, and we are, we are ourselves likened to kings and priests. We are made as kings and priests. So it means that in this life, you and I are to fulfill the role and the function or the, take up the position of a king, but at the same time also take up the role and the position of a priest. So you are both. You're not just a king. You're not just a priest. You are actually both. Now understand the other teaching of kings and priests where they say that you are provided if you're a king and you are um, uh, a clergy if you if you are a priest. I understand that they were trying to, to emphasize and show some stuff, but I believe it does go further than that, that you and I are actually both. So we need to be a provider. We need to also be a minister and a provincial. So in other words, we hear from God, we receive what God has given us, and we communicate and show that to the people that are around about us. But at the same time, we also act as a priest and we pray for our families, for our friends, for our community, for everything that's around us. Because see, the Jesus in you is the only Jesus that people might ever see that come in contact with you. So you need to be in a place where you obviously represent Christ and show Christ. So you and I are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that as we are priests, we are also kings, and we enter into the fullness thereof. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 31 reads, For you, cannot, you can only prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. So, for you can all prophesy. Prophecy is available to every single individual. You and I can bring a prophetic utterance. What that basically means is that whatever you hear from the Spirit of God, whatever you hear from the Lord, you can actually communicate and give that to whoever your audience may be. Whoever God wants to speak to, that is using you to speak to, that can be done. So you and I are therefore priests, we are kings, and we are prophets, first and foremost to our families. So we can get direction from God. God can uh, use us to be able to impact the people that are around about us. We must, as prophetic people, number one, hear the word of God for our family. So as a prophetic people, we want to and we do need to pursue God to hear what God has to say about our family and for our family. You might say, why is that necessary? The reason why is because you need to minister to them. You need to be able to pray for them. You need to be able to train them. You need to be able to guide them. You need to be able to direct them. You need to be able to bring the wisdom of God into their lives. You know, any person that is, that is worth their salt will listen to people that can bring wisdom into their lives. Because wisdom will add value to your and my life. So therefore, you and I need to understand what the purposes and plans of God are for the people that are in our family, especially our children, especially our spouses, and we as a family unit. Obviously, that's not where it ends. Obviously, it can go further than that because you also affect the social circle that's around you. You could affect the people in your local church. You can affect the people in your local community. You can affect the people in your province, your city, your town, your state, your country. All right. But the thing is, it starts out with your and my family. Each one in our family is unique and has a specific gift that God has imparted to them that needs to be unlocked. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7 says, For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God. One in this manner and another in that manner. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 7 makes it clear that we need to understand that there are gifts imparted to men, to you and me, by God. 
And it is important for you and I to determine what those gifts and abilities are and then to allow God to help us to grow them, to develop them. And that responsibility is not left to you and I on our own. The Holy Spirit is there to help us, to guide us, to lead us. And He'll come beside us and help us to unlock and unearth that gifting that is placed within us. It's also important to note that that gifting is different from one person to the other. Each one is his own gift, one in this manner and one in another. So the gifts that have been imparted to me are not necessarily gifts imparted to you, and the gifts imparted to your children are not the gifts that you have, nor the gifts that your spouse has is your gifts. They're all different. But it's important for you and I to identify those gifts and to get to know those gifts, because when we do, we can really move fast and fast into into that which God wants us to do you see whatever your call is whatever your um, your uh, mandate is whatever God has instructed you for whatever reason you are on earth today we need to understand that and we need to learn what that is it is a serious thing to to find out because if you and I do not know our gifting if we have not identified our gifting it makes it difficult for us to fulfill that which Christ has called us to remember that he's equipped you he's already provided for you he's already placed inside of you everything that is necessary for you to be able to fulfill your function your destiny and your call And because of that, because he's already filled you with all that stuff, because he's already given you all that stuff, and because it's in you, it is a no-brainer that you need to develop that stuff to be able to achieve what God wants you and I to do. So therefore, we need to work without what that is and identify it and be able to to be trained and develop it. Now, the training can take place in many different ways. We, we as, you know, if it's in your family situation, the training is not necessarily going to be a, a um, hands-on training. It might be that the person's, uh, your child's gifting is totally different to yours, but you'll be able to give oversight, mentorship, and be able to guide them and coach them in a direction that will allow their, 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 their destiny to unfold before them, for their gifting to be revealed, and for them to fulfill the call that God's placed on their lives. You see, we, <coughs> excuse me, we have not been working along those lines. I feel there's many families, there are many uh, communities where people are sitting by idly, not engaging, purely because they haven't been activated, purely because nobody has spent any time with them or even taken the, gone to the trouble of being able to help them to identify their call and their mission in life. So we need to know that as prophets then, we are a prophetic people. And we can trust God to reveal things to us through prophetic words, through prophetic unction as to what's going on in the person's life. In my personal life, I remember without, you know, the first time I accepted the call of God upon my life, it, it was amazing. It was crazy for, for about 15 minutes after we were prayed for, uh, one of the pastors started prophesying over us and he, and for 15 minutes, he just rambled. He just went on. I was so, taken out of the Spirit of God that I missed half of it because of the anointing and because I was lying on the floor half conscious. But the thing is that God nevertheless spoke an amazing word. And in that time, there was gifts being released. There was gifts being imparted. There was destiny being revealed. So many things that happened in those 15 minutes that has guided us for, for the last 25 years in ministry. So, so God has been an amazing God and we are a prophetic people. Now we can do the same thing for our children. We can do the same thing for our extended families. We can do the same thing for our church communities. We can do same, same thing for those people that God has placed in and around us. So now, God holds us responsible for what we have done with our gift. First Peter 4 verse 10 says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You see, very often I see Christians and born-again believers taking... Um, that which God has given them, that, that which He's imparted to them, and take it lightly and not give it the weight that it deserves. We need to understand that, that gifts, abilities, um, enablements, all these things that God has placed within us, that God has given us, is there to fulfill a function and to 
do what God has called us to do. So therefore, we are actually equipped to do God's purpose and God's plan. And because of that, we need to, to deal with it as good stewards. We need to deal with it as, as important. And we need to deal with it as something that's not light. Then we must, as a priestly people, we need to pray for our families. We need to pray for people that are around about us. You know, I can't tell you how critical and how important that is. Because when people are in a weak position, you know, we, we tell people to have faith and trust God and to believe God and all this kind of stuff. And yes, and all that is true. We need to have faith because without faith it's impossible to please God. And we need to exercise our faith and, faith and trust God to use us to do the things that need to be done. But on the other side of that particular coin, that same coin, when you are in a, a desperate situation, you cannot see the wood for the trees, and your, your mind is running away with you, and you're trying to take thoughts captive, and you're trying to think on things that have got positive reports and all these things, you are still battling. That is when we need to pray for one another. I can see it many, many occasions already when somebody is low, they're down, they're depressed, they're weak. They need somebody to come alongside of them that can hold them up and gear them up. I find it with married couples, especially husband and wives. Um, there's this seesaw effect that goes on. Uh, I know that when very often when I'm, I'm depressed and my wife sees it and she sees that I'm a little bit down, um, she will come and she'll pray and she'll stand in the gap and not too long down the road, then I'll come back up. And then the other times when she's but down, maybe physically or whatever the case may be, it's affecting her, her mental thoughts and all that. And I come in and I, I become the priest. I become the one in the home that, that lifts her up and, and brings her to a place of, of strength again, of encouragement, of, of upliftment. So we need to lift each one up before God so they can act, achieve all that God intends them to become. You see, we can undergird those people with prayer. If you know that your, your sons or your daughters have been called into uh, specific functions for God, specific tasks for God, specific things for God, you can pray those things through. You can stand in the gap for them. You can be there and undergird them and hold up their arms when they feel weak, when they're not strong. And you can take them into that place of, of strength. So we as priests then can fulfill that function. We can fulfill that position and we can come in from a position of strength. Then we must as kingly people rule our families, putting the word of God as our total authority. We believe the Bible cover to cover. We take the word of God, we stand on the word of God and we action the word of God. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15 reads as follows. It says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord... Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, we as a family, we already made a, a vow to God that we will serve Him with every single fiber of our being. It's no longer we that live. It's Christ who lives in us and through us. To us, our lives are directed, guided by the Word of God. And therefore, we have no choice but to obey the Word of God to the best of our ability and, what, and the way we best we know how to do it. So for us, then, we take that whole um, approach to our family and to our community. And as our vow to God stands that we will not do anything but obey His word, we stand and we live that life as an example. We imitate Christ or imitate Paul, as Paul says. We do what we believe best. And as we do that, we are trusting God to then rule and reign in our lives by the word of God. You see, you've got to understand that you and I have been given dominion over this earth. I think the best example you'll find with Adam and Eve, go and look at Genesis chapter 1, near the end of that chapter, you find that they were given dominion. Okay, go and uh, uh, multiply, replenish the earth, etc. And they were given a mandate to do that. Obviously the mandate got messed up a little bit, and we understand the results of that. But Jesus came and he restored everything. And you and I can enter into that same place of rulership and dominion today, as was intended when Adam and Eve was walking on this earth. 
So you and I have the power, we have the authority right now to <clears throat> bring into our lives everything that the Word has promised, everything that the Word has written, every promise that's in there. We have the authority, we have the power to make that effective in our lives. So as kings then, we rule and reign in this life. We have dominion. We speak the Word of God, we have the authority. And it's understanding that, that we need to then start implementing. That's why you've got to renew your mind. That's why you've got to get into the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God, get to know the Word of God, understand the Word of God, and understand your position and where you are. Because that's the only way you and I are going to effectively rule and reign as kings. Because if you do not know your position, number one, as a priest, and you do not know your position as a prophet, you're going to battle to be able to be a king. So when you come into kingship, that's when you come into a place of rulership. And that is, yes, when you provide for your family. That's when you provide for your community. That's when you stand in the gap and you, you put your faith out there and you allow every promise to manifest in your life. So you and I have to enter into that fullness with God and we have to understand what He has made available for us already. So... <clears throat> I want to quickly have a look just at, um, we're running out of, getting close to our um, deadline time here. So let me quickly just open up Telegram. I just want to make sure that uh, we have, that I haven't missed any questions. Sorry, I'm on a strange phone here, so I'm just trying to find it. Um, sorry. Okay, there we go. Okay, so just have a look. There we go. Okay, we've got one question here from, from Sharon. She says, in our homes, how do women exercise these functions as wives when husbands are to be the prophet, priest, and king in the home? No, Sharon, in God's sight, we are all the same. Okay, so God is no respecter of persons as far as that is concerned. Yes, the husband is the head of the home. And yes, he does carry certain authorities that goes with there. There's certain things that come into play because of it and certain things that we, as a husband, can pull off, which a wife might find a bit more difficult. Nevertheless, okay, because in God's sight, um, he's no, he, he, there's no distinction between man and woman. So you are, the prophet, you are a prophet, you are a king, and you are a, a priest, okay, because you are a believer because you're a member of the body of Christ, because Christ died for you very much as he died for your, for your husband and everybody else. Being a female does not make you any lesser than, than a man is. Okay? Um, in God's sight, it is, it is the same. You walk with the same authority, same power. If you see a devil coming into your house, you've got the power to, to stop him. If there's sickness and disease that tries to attach itself to your home, you've got the power to stop it. You have got the same faith, the same power to be able to stand up and to, to affect the, make the word effective in your life. You are a king in your own life and in the life of your family. You fulfill those positions just as a male does. There's no distinction. There's no difference. Hi, Pastor Les. How can we be the best teacher, prophet to our friends and family if we are not sure what our calling and gifting is? Okay. I've had many people contend and fight with what is the calling upon my life? And I know that even today there's still many people that, that, that have a battle with it. My counsel and my advice to people that are still trying to work out exactly what God is wanting you as an individual to do and what your individual role is, is to take the position that what is the will of God? What does God want? And all you do is say, listen, right now I'm working for Jesus. What Jesus wants, I'm going to do. And find out in the scriptures what Jesus wants. Now, we obviously know the, 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 the great commandment. We understand the love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Don't love your brothers and humans yourself. So we know we need to look after people and love people and care for people. We also understand the great commission. We understand that going to all the world, preach the gospel, and to make disciples. So we understand that. So we need to share the message of the gospel, and we need to encourage those that have already accepted Christ into their lives and make disciples of those people. So everything we do then, we work towards those particular things. What you will find happening, okay, and this is what I encourage many people in, is that once you start embarking on fulfilling His will, 
It is amazing how suddenly your purpose starts crystallizing day to day because you'll find the Holy Spirit directing your steps. Because see, the, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. So as you fulfill God's will, as you fulfill God's plan, as you pursue God and what He wants, you will find that He'll start ordering your steps aright. Okay, He will start pushing you in directions and places you need to go to be able to do that which you are equipped to do. And only you are equipped to do. He will direct you in that, that direction. The Holy Spirit will guide you into that direction. So even as you go into that direction, you'll start seeing the, 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 the hand of the Lord upon your life. Another way of learning what, what your call is, is to also look at things that, that um, you've got a passion for, that you've got a desire for, things that, that you find reasonably easy to fulfill and to accomplish. Those things are all things that will help you guide you in a direction. And of course, the prophetic word. Okay, um, very often when prophetic words comes, God will give direction through that prophetic word, whether it be for a season or whether it for a duration of time, doesn't matter. And then something else I'll normally point out to people as well is that a call, is, sorry, a, a, if, if you're called into something, it could change, all right? I've, I've seen people where God has tasked them, if I can use that word, where for a season, maybe for two, three years, they do ABC. And then after three or four years, the whole thing changes and God pulls them into a different direction and they do E, F, and G. So it varies and it, it can change like that as well. So that's why I say to people, you know, I know that people normally want to have direction and say, hey, listen, God has called me to be a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or whatever. The, 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 the truth of the matter is, Yes, God might call you to be equipped as a, a nurse or a doctor, maybe in the medical field, but he might then actually get you to work in, in some other places where that skill set that you've acquired can be used, but it's not necessary in a hospital or in a clinic or in a, uh, um, a uh, you know, the, the doctor's rooms or anything like that. So we need to keep our hearts and minds open when it comes to the call of God. So... To me, the safe route has always been, what does Jesus want? Let me build his kingdom. Let me find out what his will is, and I'll just add to that. And then he'll direct me and guide me in the rest of the things. All right. Okay, so that seems to be most of the questions and answers that have come through there now. All right, we still got about five minutes left. So... We need to look then at this and conclude. Understand that there's positions or roles or functions, whatever you want to call it, that is priestly role, a kingly role, and a prophetic role. And all three of these are things that Jesus did and was part of his character and part of who he was. You and I, because we imitate us of Christ and because we follow Christ and we do what we, we use him as our example, and because scripture enlightens us and tells us that we can follow into those positions ourselves, you have a priestly function, you have a, a prophetic function, and you have a kingly function. So you can be the king in your life and in the kingdom of God. It's a position of rulership. It's a position that puts you in authority. It's a position where you have influence, where you can bring um, uh, certain things into play. And then you have the prophetic role. The prophetic role is where you hear the voice of God, where you take what God has communicated to you, spoken to you, and you apply it to the human race, to the people that are specifically around you, very often first your family, then going into the community, maybe your suburb, maybe your city, your town, or it can be your church community, whichever communities. You know, we, we as people have got so many groups around us nowadays where we have influence. And it, I believe it refers to those influence groups at the end of the day. And then you have the priestly role. The priestly role is where you stand in and you pray people before God. You bring them before God and you pray for them. You bring their needs before God. You intercede for them if necessary. And you deal with everything that is between man and God. So let's just, no, I see no more questions. So let's just end in this time in prayer. And then uh, we'll close off and wait for the next lecturer to start up. So let's just pray together. Father, we just thank you this evening. 
Father, for your word that has gone forth, I thank you for your word that cannot and will not return void, that has accomplished absolutely everything that it's sent out to do, Lord. We thank you, my Father, that even as people come to understand the roles in their lives of being priests, the roles in their lives of being prophets, the roles in their lives of being kings, Lord, that, Lord, we can look at Jesus and we can see exactly how he dealt with those functions or roles in his life. And as we do that, we can see that we've been given the dominion on this earth to rule and reign, to be victorious, to see lives changed and people touched for Christ. So Lord, as we now, each one goes our own way, I pray that you'll just keep your people safe until we come together again. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you.